My wife, Katie uh, Gorka, has published a long analysis yesterday in The Federalist about the sources of the violence and also the question of how you weaponize protests. Katie, um, let's talk about this individual, Eugene Methvin, and why is he so important to answering the question of where does this violence come from? Well, so there was a similar moment back in the 1960s to what we're going through today. President Eisenhower was supposed to make a state visit to Japan in 1960, and the trip had to be canceled because there were protests, and everybody says these are communists who were protesting. And uh, DeWitt Wallace, who was the legendary editor of the Reader's Digest. Which was an incredibly influential organ back then. Very powerful, very good quality publication back then. Um, He said... First of all, how do we know they're communists? And second, if they're communists, how do they start a riot? And so he put these two questions on the desk of a young journalist at the time from Georgia. 26-year-old Eugene Methvin. Eugene Methvin. And, and he, studied it for, he studied that question for how long? Ten years. So when he started, there were really no riots going on in the States. It really didn't ha- start up until about 1965. And then, of course, as we all know, the country exploded over the next few years. Um, but it is incredible for today's purposes to go back and read what he found, because the parallels are just profound. So talk to us about what he found back then in America in the 60s. Talk to us about Students for a Democratic Society and Tom Hayden. And what, what, what is the, what are the, you've read his book, Riot Makers, the seminal book. What did you learn? So what I learned was well, two things that I think are particularly important for today. So the first one is everybody concluded, even about the riots in the 60s, that they were spontaneous. <laughs> What Methvin, in fact, they were called righteous protests. Um, what Methvin discovered, though, and, and the, the SDS made no secret about it, Methvin discovered that this, young, this group of young, primarily white Marxists called Students for a Democratic Society. Who were linked eventually to the Weather Underground. Who the, they became, part of them became yes. the terrorists, the Weather Underground. Um, They went into 10 cities of the Northeast and spent three years in those cities stoking grievances. Now, to be fair, the black populations in those cities had very legitimate grievances, right? Much as today we can say there are, you know, there are reasons to talk about late, you know, holdovers of of racism. Like, we're not saying there's no problems. But what what, um, Hayden and, and his compatriots did was go into these cities and really stoke grievances but so this was a plan i mean they had a plan to exploit grievances into violence they were very open about their plan they talked about their plan yep and and not only here's what's interesting not only did they stoke the grievances they actually provided the tools so they taught people how to make molotov cocktails they instructed people throw them at white people throw them at police they did a lot to raise uh, anger with the police. That was a very big feature. And so when, you know, there was an incident very similar to the George Floyd killing where two black men were seen being dragged into a police station in Newark. And that was the that was the explosion that set off days and days of riots. And then, of course, it spread around the country. Just so people understand, this isn't theorizing. This is documented fact. This individual we're talking about, Tom Hayden, remarkably was published in the New York Times Review of Books. And in Katie's article, there is a quote from that piece from Tom Hayden in the New York Times Review of Books. The role of organized violence is now being carefully considered. During a riot, for instance, a conscious guerrilla, fascinating language, a conscious guerrilla can participate in pulling police away from the path of people engaged in attacking stores, looting. He can create disorder in new areas the police think are secure. He can carry the torch, if not of all the people, to white neighborhoods and downtown business districts. If necessary, he can successfully shoot to kill. I mean, that could be today, could it not? You can't tell me that the protesters today, the rioters, are not using that very same playbook. I no. mean, it's word for word. Yeah, the, the article we're talking is about my wife, 
uh, is written by my wife, Katie Gorka. It's at The Federalist. You can catch it right now on our Twitter and Facebook feeds. It is entitled How the 1960s Riots Foreshadow Today's Communist Weaponization of Black Pain. And the most interesting question, is there a connection between the SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, from the 1960s, and what we are seeing on the streets of America today, and the Black Lives Matter movement. For the answer to that question, stay tuned here on America First, live streaming on YouTube, on Facebook, available on Instagram TV. Of course, wherever you get your podcast from, subscribe today, and don't forget our YouTube channel. Hit the subscription button, and then the notifications bell twice, because that's how sneaky they are, and you'll never miss a thing. America first. Magnificent. Ed Fulner gave us the Heritage Foundation. What an American hero. And now there's an institute, there's a center named after him at Heritage. And Katie Gorka happens to be one of its directors. Follow her right now, Gorka KT on Twitter. And check out her article, How the 1960s Riots Foreshadow Today's Communist Weaponization of Black Pain. We can't go into all the details, but talk about some of the figures, your colleagues and others, who've looked at the the organic connections between the SDS of the 1960s and Black Lives Matter today. Yeah, so very importantly, SDS um, sort of eventually split and it developed a militant wing called the Weather Underground. And there are people today from the Weather Underground who are tied to Black Lives Matter. A number of great people have, have been documenting that. My colleague, Mike Gonzalez, Andrew Sullivan, who does such a good job, Andrew McCarthy, um, Kyle Scheidler have all documented this. And, and the, the, those me- names are mentioned in your article. Yeah, and the links to the, to their articles are in my article. At The Federalist. You can yep. check it out on our feeds. In the last two minutes we have, the, the big point of your article, whether it's what happened in the 60s or today, is really a very sad point. What is that point, Katie? Well, that is that economists learned years after the riots that took place in the 1960s, which were supposed to be to help black people. Ultimately, it was black people that they really hurt. So the cities where these riots took place, it hurt black property values and it hurt black employment for decades, not just short term, for decades. So when they say Black Lives Matter. Yeah, it's just about what, really? It's about the revolution. It's they want to overthrow America and they're using black people to do it. So the exploitation of, in many cases, real grievances, but truly for political purposes. And it's hard to deny when it's on their website. These are people who have admitted that they're what politically? They're Marxists, correct? Yep, that's right. Yeah, well, this is this is the matter at hand. The stakes involved 48 days to go. We did an hour-long interview with the great Douglas Murray. We're going to be posting it separately on YouTube. And he said a very simple thing. You can't be afraid any longer. You can't be afraid of cancel culture. We are the freest generation the world has ever seen. What would your ancestors, what would your grandparents say? That you're afraid because of some thugs on social media? We can't allow the mob to take control whether it's on social media, whether it's on your private life, whether it's out in public, we must stand up to these people just for future generations' sake, not just our own. I am Sebastian Gorka. This is America First on the Salem Radio Network, broadcasting across the nation. Please subscribe to us on YouTube, wherever you you get your podcasts. Check out our website, sebgorka.com. It's a great day to be American. Let's celebrate the Abraham Accords, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Keep your head on a swivel, watch your six, never give up, never give in, hold the line, and now for 48 days and beyond, stay frosty.